This will be my final analysis of Alan Holdsworth's harness. As with my Ebo reverse engineering video series, things didn't really come together until part three. There will not be a sound demo. I will conduct a few more tests, discuss how I believe the circuit works, and share more interesting things. I have a couple of corrections to make and a few responses to viewer comments before I get to my conclusions about the harness. First, a quick word about the nichrome coils. A few people have commented that I can't have the coils that close together, or more specifically touching, because it will dramatically reduce the resistance, blah, blah, blah. Nichrome wire is dozens of times less conductive than copper wire, so it's not really a big deal. Let me demonstrate. I'm going to demonstrate something about the nature of nichrome wire. This is a piece I have left over from my original winding that you saw in part one. It was too long and I snipped this off. And as you can see, it's measuring 5.2 ohms. Now I'm going to take this and basically squish these all together. That's reading 4.7 ohms. So it's not really that big a deal if the coils are touching. Yes, it slightly reduces the resistance, but you have to keep in mind that nichrome wire is like dozens of times less conductive than copper wire. And in my build, I can actually slide a piece of paper between most of the coils. A few of them are touching, but most of them have a gap between because when you wind this up, it relaxes. And it's not a perfect coil anyways when you do it by hand. So not really a big deal. The second point that I want to reiterate is that the harness is not a power soak or an attenuator. I'm not sure exactly which unit people are referring to when they say that. While it is true that they can both accomplish the same thing, the harness strictly replaces the speaker, and there is only a line level output. Tom Scholz's power soak is strictly a switchable resistive load, which uses a truckload of ceramic resistors. Allen's unit uses coiled nichrome wires to provide the current handling capability and heat dissipation, and it has inductors in it. Therefore, it is a reactive circuit. Let's take a look inside a, quote, vintage, unquote, power soak for just a minute. There were three versions. They are only different in how the interfaces are arranged. Here we can see the PCB, or otherwise known as printed circuit board, which has 24 ceramic resistors on it. The back side of the PCB has a lot of copper, which I assume is for heat dissipation. There is a high wattage selector switch that switches between various output levels and also an impedance switch. The enclosure is perforated metal for maximum possible ventilation. For what it is, not a bad design. The patent, U.S. patent number 4,363,934, has a schematic included in it if you want to look it up. So as we can see, it's nothing like Allen's unit. Okay, now with that out of the way, one correction that I need to make is regarding the impedance numbers that I produced in part two. They are not correct. That is due to the way that my LCR meter works, and it gave me false readings, and I should have known better, but I went with it anyways. <laughs> so I reran this simulation with LT Spice, and this is the impedance curve that it produced. Next, I wanted to see how the real world compared. I tried to be as accurate as possible in my manual testing. These numbers could be off a little bit, but even so, you should get an idea of what Allen's unit is doing, which is unlike anything else out there as far as I can tell. You should be able to see why this unit is potentially very hard on an output transformer and potentially outright dangerous for an output transformer on some amps. In order to do this testing, I had to create this crazy looking contraption. Because it is tedious and very procedural, I made this simply to make it a lot easier to take measurements. I used the standard method of determining impedance. I'm not sure if my results are 100% accurate, but for this, humor me for the moment. I won't bore you with all the details of what all these things are for, but you can see here the process involved for each frequency that I tested for. Building these test fixtures is nearly as much fun as it is to create the things I'm testing with them. By the way, here are my two technical advisors, Ollie and Ringo. You may have heard them in the background on my videos. They are green cheek conyers. I would not have been able to do any of these things without their help.
I figured I'd go all out on this thing and also recreate the coil shield that Alan had in his unit. And it's made from the same cookie sheet that the base plate was made from. And I went ahead and kind of recreated what he put on there. Except I signed my name here. Actually, my wife is the one who wrote that because I only write in all caps. Just a carryover from my board drafting days in the early 90s. But uh, anyways, there's that. It doesn't really affect anything. I don't honestly know why this is in Alan's unit. I mean, it's in an enclosure, so no idea. Here are the results of my test. The plot looks very similar to LT Spice. However, my measurements between 20 Hz and 2 kHz are about 30% higher than what LT Spice comes up with. In either case, if 40 to 50 ohms of impedance in the general frequency range of the guitar, we are far above the 4, 8, or 16 ohms that an output transformer would be looking for. This will cause the output transformer to saturate and the power tubes to work a lot harder. It seems as though that Alan's thought process may have been how to create a matching network to get the signal from the output transformer secondary to a line level output. It seems that his intent was to match the DC resistance and inductance of the output transformer with the DC resistance and inductance of the harness circuit. The line level circuit is across the input and is knocked down to line level by a voltage divider. Allen is adding a lot of series inductance in his unit. There are what I believe to be seven one millihenry air core inductors, which increase in value when attached to the base plate with long screws and even more with the large fender washers at the top of them. So technically they're not really air core inductors anymore. In my quasi-replica, which is still not a verified circuit, there is a total of 10 millihenries of inductance. Now consider that most 12-inch guitar speakers have a voice coil inductance of between 0.1 and roughly 0.5 millihenries. This massive amount of inductance makes the output transformer work a lot harder, not to mention what appears to be a very large increase in impedance. This is how Alan achieved cranked amp tone silently or at conversation level. Alan was not a guitar pedal guy, so this was the path he chose. In part two, I demonstrated the mutual inductance coupling occurring between the inductors. While reminiscent of Wardenclyffe Tower and it being nifty to be able to detect it and see it on an oscilloscope, I think the effect of this on the sound will be very small compared to the aforementioned info. I do have one other interesting thing to quickly demonstrate. So I was playing around with this idea of combining signals of two different frequencies from my function generators here and I discovered something really trippy. Now check this out. I have these connected to a blend pot and when I put it in the center it's turning into a phaser. This is really a trip. I'm not sure why that's happening. It might just be something to do with the phasing between the two function generators here, but I can get it to do it on various frequencies. This one, it seems to do it pretty nicely around 488 hertz. So, not sure what's going on with that, but I was not expecting this to happen. That's really a trip. I think what may be going on here is these capacitors inside the function generators are somehow interacting with the circuit and maybe the two units are a little out of phase with each other or something. So we end up getting this phasing effect. It's pretty weird, but uh, very interesting. What I originally wanted to show was the effect the circuit has on a triangle wave. As you can see here, it's kind of sort of turning the triangle wave into like shark fins, which is indicating it's, there's something going on with harmonics and there's kind of also a time delay element happening here. And that's, I can't really determine what exactly is going on without a spectrum analyzer, but I just wanted to show that there is something going on with harmonics and there is a time delay um, aspect to the circuit. I tried finding the resonant frequency of the circuit with my oscilloscope and it appears to be around 8 kHz. 
So I worked backwards to figure out the approximate capacitance using the same online calculator that I showed in my previous video to determine the approximate capacitance of the circuit. It appears to be something along the lines of 3800 picofarads, which seems pretty reasonable considering all the losses and stuff. Much more reasonable than 66 microfarads. Returning to impedance for just a moment, it appears that I was led down the wrong path because of how my LCR meter works. It might be taking the inductive reactance value and reinterpreting it as a capacitance reactance, then converting that to a capacitance. Or it might even take the total impedance and convert that to a capacitance. The nichrome wire coils have a tiny bit of inductance. Each one measures 0 0.03 millihenries. Speaking of nichrome wire coils, there's one more thing that I'd like to show you. I was curious about what happens possibly to the impedance when these nichrome heating elements start warming up. Is it going to change? Is it going to change the DC resistance here? So what I decided to do is do a test and I've rigged up a little system here where I can have a soldering iron heat up these coils and I have a, a, temp a thermometer here to monitor the temperature and what I want to do is basically watch what the DC resistance is um, across the speaker jack here and just see how much it changes like what kind of percentage it is it might not really change at all because we're only talking about maybe a couple hundred degrees I don't know how hot these things can get um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say well maybe it might get up to 200 degrees and I'm just gonna warm up these coils to about 200 degrees or so maybe they'll go up to like 225 and just see what the resistance does I don't know that it's gonna really change I think you have to pump a lot of current through them um, to get the resistance to go down like 5% or whatever it is. But to satisfy my own curiosity, I'm just going to go ahead and run this test and I'll come back when uh, we've reached like 200 or so degrees and I'll share my results then. Okay, so that test that I proposed didn't work. Um, I guess I was a little naive in thinking that I could just apply heat to the coils here and have them heat up. The problem is that the nichrome wire is just not conductive. I've tried all kinds of different methods. I actually had the soldering iron just directly touching these things and they wouldn't heat up past like an inch from where the soldering iron was touching. So I can't, I can't do that test. Um, but I'm going to try another test. I'm going to take a little short coil here. I want to put the soldering iron in the middle of this thing and just see what happens to the resistance. Um, I'm just going to let the soldering iron heat it up and whatever temperature it gets to, if it's hot enough to melt the uh, tin lead solder, then we'll know what temperature it is at least because we know at what temperature that lead tin solder will melt. This nichrome wire is interesting stuff. I've had this soldering iron sitting here in this coil for 20-30 minutes and it's definitely hot enough to melt solder. And yet, I can stick my finger on this bolt that it's connected to it's not even warm. So that's kind of showing that nichrome wire is really a poor conductor. It's, there's so much resistance that you can't even have this short piece of wire heated up by a soldering iron directly in contact with it. So the only way you can really get it to heat up is by pumping current through it, which is the way it is used in, in the world, you know, in heaters and toasters and that sort of stuff. Um, by the way, I did measure this before I started. It was 1.4 ohms, and I just measured it a second ago. Still 1.4 ohms. I don't think the resistance is going to change until you hit maybe 300, 350 degrees. It might drop very slightly, like 3%. And at like four or 500 degrees, it's only going to be like 5% difference in resistance. So I guess it's not really as big a factor as I was initially thinking but 
I don't know, I just had to satisfy my own curiosity because I have no experience with this nichrome wire and it's interesting. If you're still with me at this point, the following I think is one of the most interesting aspects of the harness. Keep in mind that the stimulation is theoretical and it may not match real world perfectly and some things don't line up exactly, but you should get an idea of what happens when the harness is connected to an amp. So in LT Spice, I have modeled a Marshall-esque output section with a 50 watt output transformer and I have it connected to the harness. This is a look at a 247 hertz sine wave coming out of the output transformer. It's classic tube amp distortion with soft corners. Here we can see the frequency response in decibels, and here it is as a linear plot. The voltages at left aren't correct, but nonetheless, I think the curve will still be the same. LT Spice is placing a resonant peak at 2.5 kHz, and in my replica, it's more like 8 kHz. I'm not sure why they are so far apart. There may be some other factors at work here. We'll see in a minute that it's not really that important anyways. Thanks to some generous people, I have verified that the base plate is actually galvanized steel. This would tend to increase the inductance of the circuit by some amount, but it's not going to be anything dramatic. Penultimately, let's take a look at the impedance. Notice how it's now like a mirror of what it looks like as a standalone unit. The impedance starts out high and then it is pretty flat from about 300 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So it would appear that the impedance numbers that I derived aren't really that significant because the properties of the output transformer will completely override all that stuff. Here are my final thoughts. I have recently been able to see the inside of a harness 2. It is considerably different than the harness 1 which I have tried to replicate. In hindsight, armed with this new information, I am happy that I didn't attempt to use this replica with any of my non-master volume amps. Also, I don't think anyone would have been impressed by my half-black-faced 1974 twin reverb going into this circuit. It's just not going to sound good. If I had a Mesa Boogie to try this with, maybe we could have done that. Um, so this is about as much as I've been able to determine from just a few pictures and some input for some other people, and my attempt at a replica, which I think is most of the way there. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. I hope I conveyed the idea that the harness really cannot be compared to anything else, and especially not in the how it feels department. Ask the people that own one. Thanks to all that have contacted me with information and various things and all the comments. I appreciate that. Um, and special thanks to the one legend who actually played and toured with Alan, you know who you are.